Good morning, Year 8. My name's Mr Edmund. I'm an English teacher at Van Dyke. I teach media studies as well, both subjects I love. I've been there for quite a while. I've been there for um, 16 years. I'm an old timer. Uh, both my children have gone through the school as well. So absolutely love being at Van Dyke. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you guys arriving in school in September as our new year nines. So we're reading The Wall by William Sutcliffe. Uh, it's been very enjoyable. The um, the reading so far by teachers have been enjoyable to watch. I've got a quite exciting sort of uh, novel. Lots of things going on. So we're going to continue with another uh, another section of the novel today, which I'll be reading to you. So, The Wall by William Sutcliffe. I stop playing football at lunchtime. Instead, I go to the library to do my homework or at least to pretend to do my homework. That's what I lay out in front of me, but I usually just sit there, thinking, daydreaming, drawing. I never let myself draw the tunnel, in case anyone sees and asks awkward questions, but I do draw the buildings and people I saw on the other side. I want to help myself remember, or forget, or perhaps a mixture of the two. I don't honestly know why I keep on drawing these things, but it's what always seems to come out of my pen. The ragged streets, the puddles, the water tanks on every roof, the wires everywhere. A few faces, and that girl. Again and again, her thin, serious features, her stick-like arms, her blazing eyes. Just how thin was she? I draw and draw, but I can't get it right. I'm not sure I remember her correctly. The more versions I produce, the less accurate they seem. The harder I struggle to grasp it, the more elusive her image becomes. One day after school, I realise my feet aren't walking me home. They are leading me in the other direction, out of the town, along a road I've never, be, never taken, be, taken alone, never before taken alone, and never on foot. I don't know why it happens, but on a quiet... On a quiet, ordinary Wednesday afternoon, I find myself walking to the checkpoint. The town stops abruptly. The last house, which is the same as mine, right down to the pale stone driveway spotted with engine oil and a, a neat rectangle of lawn, sits next to an expanse of rocky emptiness. The road carries on as before, a wide stretch of smooth, fresh tarmac with a crisp, crisply painted white line down the middle, just the same through the neat, polite little streets as now. Beyond this invisible border into barren scrubland dotted with low thorny bushes and the occasional cactus. A few plots are laid out alongside the road, with string pulled taut across metal pegs, but no building work seems to have started. I can't tell if these are just speculative markings or if the land has been bought and a house is on the way. Buildings appear fast here. Nothing happens for long, for long stretches of time. Then you find yourself walking down a street of houses you've never seen before, filled with families you've never met. I walk on, squinting in the harsh sunlight. There's no shade anywhere, and my shirt is soon soaked with sweat. The sun seems to bounce up off the tarmac, attacking my face from above and below. The horizon bubbles in the heat haze, as if the land itself is close to boiling point. A round concrete building, like a squat armoured air traffic control tower, is the first part of the checkpoint to come into view. Of course, I've seen it hundreds of times before, but only while passing through by car, never like this on foot, with no time to notice how tall it is, how forbidding. I can't see any soldiers looking down, but the angle of the concrete parapet looks as if it would conceal whatever or whoever is up there. Under the tower is a tangled thatch of razor wire, trailing over the whole area where the wall expands out into a zone of warehouse-like corrugated iron huts, metal fencing, steel gates and dense, seemingly random scatterings of concrete roadblocks. As I get closer, I see the road where cars from my side cross, cross the wall. 
One bored-looking soldier is waving everyone through, unimpeded. Just the colour of your number plate is enough to get you through with only a brief pause. Everyone in a Marius has yellow, yellow number plates. And if you are yellow, you can get through any checkpoint or roadblock without being held up. Number plates of cars from the other side are white with green text. And those are, the pulled, o and those are pulled over and searched. I can see one family seated silently on a rock beside their car, whose doors, boot and bonnet are open. While a pair of soldiers, young looking guys, 18 or 19, examine the upholstery in the engine. Through a separate gateway, I see the traffic moving in the other direction. A trickle of vehicles, mainly lorries and old cars, one at a time, like drops le leaking from a tap. A fenced pedestrian pathway emerges to this gate, carrying a steady stream of people. Most of them seem to have similar expressions on their faces, distant, wary, as if they hurry out and walk, as they hurry out, and walk towards a concourse where swarms of minibuses gather and leave rapidly and efficiently, sweeping people away from the looming wall. All the buses seem to start in this one place. None come through the checkpoint. I know from maps how the wall follows a looping, circuitous, circuitous, circuitous route that makes no apparent sense. I'd heard rumours that people from the other side often had to cross over just to get from place to place within their own territory. It certainly looks that way from the, from the movements I see here, with everyone who comes through seemingly Im, seeming immediately to set off elsewhere. No one walks up the road where I am, where I am standing, towards a Marius. Behind me, I notice a rocky outcrop, as high as the wall. I climb it, scampering up the hot, crumbly surface on all fours, in the hope that I might get a view of the other side. A tiny cascade of stones skitters down in my wake. From the top, I can't see much more than a jumbled tangle of rooftops, covered with those familiar water tanks, but from one vantage point, an angle, through the gateway, in the wall gives me a glimpse of something I've never seen before. The approach to the other side of the checkpoint, an area shielded from the view of passing cars by a large welcome to Amarias hoard, uh, hoarding. My view isn't much more than a narrow slice, but it's enough to make out a network of metal cages, like something for funneling livestock. Each cage is as wide as one person, with thick metal bars left and right and above. A long snake of men, women and children fills each cage, shuffling slowly forward in single file, held back by remotely operated turnstiles, which seem to be allowing them through one at a time. Above these cages are raised gantries, with soldiers pacing up and down, watching over the caged people, rifles clutched in both hands. I can make out a low bunker made of the thickest concrete I have ever seen, which looks as if it contains more soldiers, presumably the ones operating the turnstiles. The front of the queue leads into a building with a, a metal roof. I can't see what happens in there, or guess how long people are stopped before being allowed through the wall, but I can see that the queue is lengthy and slow moving. Looking again at the faces of people hurrying out and making for their buses, I see something else, something I haven't noticed before, an expression poised between patient, uh, patience and rage, weariness and defiance, pride and helplessness. I sit and watch, unobserved. I think again of the boy who spat on me, remembering the feeling of his clammy saliva spattering on my cheek, into my cheek and eyelid, a memory still nauseating and repugnant, but now not quite so baffling. I'm not sure if this is what I expected to see. I haven't particularly thought about the checkpoint before, about how people get from one side of the wall to the other. So I don't really have an alternative vi vision in my mind that this could either confirm or contradict. But as I watch, I feel a curdling, clenching sensation in my stomach. It's strange enough just to sit and observe, knowing how often I've driven through without the slightest hindrance. More bizarre, is the knowledge that soon I won't be I won't be just a spectator. 
It isn't long before I'll be a soldier. Possibly one of those soldiers, sitting in a bomb-proof bunker and operating an electric turnstile, or walking that gantry with a rifle pointed down at a caged line of people. If you refuse, you're sent to prison. I want to leave the outcrop, but I feel paralysed by what I'm seeing, transfixed by the fates, faces coming through the checkpoint. Only as the light begins to fade do I climb down and head home, walking fast yet mindlessly through the town, barely seeing the streets around me. The row after row of identical houses, the neat little buildings with their neat little windows, and red tiled roofs like something flown in from an American TV show, and randomly plonked there, through thousands of miles, though that <clears throat> plonked there, thousands of miles away, on a barren hilltop. Everything in Amarius is so new, so fresh, it's almost as if a magic spell has conjured it, conjured it up out of thin air, and no one seems to find this strange. No one seems to worry that there might be some other spell somewhere that could make the place disappear as quickly as it, as it appeared. At the doorstep, I delay putting in my key and stand in a daze, staring at our tiny patch of grass. The sprinkler is spitting an arc of water across the lawn, whirring round and round. I look at the car in the driveway, our little Japanese saloon, my eye drawn to the number plate, the yellow number plate. This is our key to the wall. With a yellow number plate, you are not checked at a checkpoint, so the wall isn't really a wall. And we can go where we want, on new roads, specifically built to take us to other new towns, populated by other people with the same yellow number plates. With a white number plate, you are on a different map, subject to different rules. Wherever we choose to live, wherever we built our towns, people like me got these yellow checkpoint opening plates. Everyone else, living all around us, could only get white ones. With this yellow rectangle on your car, the army was your friend, and you could move freely. With a white one, the wall, the barbed wire, the soldiers, the watchtowers, the guns, had another meaning entirely. I turned away from the car, not wanting to look at it any longer, but confronted by my front door, I freeze. Like an actor with no lines in his head, scared to go on stage, I feel as if I have a part to play, a role I have been assigned, but I can no longer remember what it is. Mum opens the door. What are you doing? I work my tongue around my mouth, looking for words. I couldn't find my key. It's in your hand. I got it just now. It was in the wrong pocket. She frowns, and I can see the next question forming on her lips, so I put my head down and walk in heading straight for my room. I can hear her voice behind me, asking what happened to my face, bleating about sunburn, but the sound of it gets pleasingly quieter as I walk away, and is reduced to almost nothing when I close my door. I feel strange later, as I sit down for dinner, as if I'm not quite myself, and the room around me isn't the room I'm used to. I think of how the rows of identical houses seemed vaguely unreal after what I saw at the checkpoint, and now the inside of my own living room has a strange glossy quality to it, like something up on a stage. It feels like a room pretending to be a room, with possessions placed in it to keep up the act. I look around at the bookcases and the jaunty paintings on the red walls, the plump sofas, the mauve light fittings, the plasma TV, and not one thing I can see feels like it is mine. A man speaks, and it's Liev, the man who pretends to be my father, sitting at the table that pretends to be a dining table in the house that pretends to be my house. He rushes through the blessings and carves out a skeleton-like rack of lamb. Putting down the knife, he turns to me and examines my sunburn. It's unusual for Liev to, to look at me like this, as if he's really looking. So what happened to your face? He says, smirking. What's happened to yours? Is the obvious answer. But you can't say things like that to Liev. He'd get so angry, his head would explode. Pieces of bread would fly everywhere. 
a storm of hairy spiders. Instead of brain, millions of prayers would fly out in, out on tiny bits of paper, like confetti. I can picture it. Cheeky comment, red nose, bulging eyes, pulsating veins, boom, flying spiders, prayer confetti. I just shrug. You have to be more careful, says mum. Skin cancer's not a joke. Knock, knock, I say. What? Who's there? Skin cancer. Stop it, she snaps. You're right, I say. It's not a joke. What's he talking about? Says Liev to mum. She shakes her head and cuts her meat. So where did you go? Says Liev. Your mother says you were late again. I chew and chew and chew. The lamb turning leathery and dry in my mouth. If you magnify a virus a hundred thousand times, you get a big fluffy ball that looks like a mouthful of chewed lamb. For a while, I think through the lies or excuses I could use, then decide not to bother. I feel weird, almost weightless. As I say casually, the checkpoint. The Ev's knives, cl knife clangs against his, his plate. Is this another joke? He says. What, like skin cancer? Such a smart guy. Always the smart guy. I leave her a hunk of lamb away from the bone, not looking at him. The fat stretches into transparent string, stringy gunge before it snaps and gives way. I just hope you're joking, he says. You didn't, says Mum. Why would you do that? It's not safe. How can it not be safe? It's crawling with soldiers. Ignore him, says Liev. He thinks he knows everything. And we'll see where that gets him. Did you go there? Says Mum. He's just trying to shock us, says Liev. Don't give him the oxygen. I'm warning you, says Mum. We lock eyes. And I can see that she doesn't know what she's warning me against. Or what she's threatening me with. Or who I am. Or what I want. It's as if we're looking at each other through a pane of glass. Like you see in prison movies. When your visitor's right in front of you, but you have to talk on the phone. For an instant, I feel sorry for her. And I can see her reading my thought. I'm not sure which one of us is the prisoner, which one is the visitor. I give her a little half smile, and she half smiles back. But there's something so pleading and desperate in her expression that I have to look away and turn back to my food. Eventually, I escape the table, having forced down half a plateful of the ma of main course and refused the dessert. It's only the excuse of a homework backlog that gets me away. All evening I stare at my school books, but the text swims incomprehensibly in front of my eyes. I can't focus. My thoughts just slide again and again back to the checkpoint, to the cages and guns and razor wire, to the checkpoint and the girl. I have two homework deadlines the next day, but I can't write a word. As the time reaches nine, then ten o'clock, and I realise I'm never going to finish or even start, it occurs to me that tomorrow I will be punished. But this idea seems ridiculous. The word punished feels like a joke. In bed with the light off, long into the night, the same thing, on and on, the checkpoint, the cages, the guns, the razor wire, the wall, the lines of people and their clenched bitter faces. The girl. Saturdays are quiet in Amar Am Amarius. All the shops shut, barely a car moves on the streets. Liev doesn't even like me going outside with a, ba with a ball in case the neighbours, or God, are watching. Liev always turns his armchair, which usually faces the TV, towards the patio doors. He unlocks the glass-fronted cabinet which looms over the dining table, takes out one of his big leather-bound texts and sits there for hours on end. The book stays open on that chair all day and no one else is allowed to touch it. 
even when Liev is doing something else. If someone visits, the chair still stays like that, facing away from the room, so people know they are interrupting. Liev knows I'm never going to be like him. And he gave up trying to fix me years ago. My job on Saturday is to catch up on my homework while trying to avoid expiring with boredom. As long as Liev doesn't see me working, he doesn't mind. And since his chair is always pointing outwards, he doesn't see anything. Perhaps that's the point. As long as I don't touch the TV, he isn't too bothered with what, too bothered what I do. At the end of the day, the book goes back on the shelf, the cabinet doors are locked, the chair is, always, is turned back towards the room, and we eat. It's the slowest day of the week, with every hour, every minute dragging on, as if someone's filled all the clocks with treacle. But this Saturday seems to crawl past in it at its usual speed, and also somehow vanish in a flash. I spend the whole day in my room, and at the end of it all, None of my homework has been finished. I don't, want to, I don't know what I've done or where the time went. I've drawn a perfect spiral on a page of, of mass paper just by colouring in the tiny squares. I've done an exhaustive study of which stoins, coins can stand on their edges for the longest times on a variety of surfaces and I've pe peeled an invisible shiny layer off a history textbook without making a single tear. So it still looks the same, just not shiny anymore. As for my actual work, nothing. We eat dinner in near silence, with a strange tension ho hovering over the table. Mum clears the metal, clucking disapprovingly at my half-full plate. She goes backwards and forwards from the kitchen, taking away the plates, glasses and cutlery. Taking away the plates, glasses and cutlery. Try again. She goes backwards and forwards from the kitchen, taking away the plates, glasses and cutlery. Then the water jug, napkins, candlestick and even the placemats. Each time she returns from the kitchen empty handed. Liev watches, not moving from his chair, breathing noisily through his nose. I hear the scrape and clatter of leftovers going into the bin. A splash as the water jug is emptied into the sink. Eventually, she returns and sits. There's no dessert. The table is bare. She looks at me, looks at Liev, looks at her hands, leans forward. Suddenly this feels less like a meal, and more like a business meeting. There's an awkward silence before she clears her throat and says cheerily, <clears throat> We've been looking into child psychologists. Not that you're a child anymore, but there are some very good ones in the city. What? We think it's a good idea. What are you talking about? We'd like to help you. I stand, wanting to run away from the table, away from my mother and Liev, out of the house, out of Amarius. I see, I see, like a minuscule dream, as long as a blink, a vision of myself, running through rocky scrubland, up a hill, with nothing around me. You think I'm mad? Is that what you're saying? No, you just seem troubled. And you don't want to talk to us about it, so I thought maybe we should find someone else. I can think of no answer, so I just stare at her, thrown by a sudden onrush of conflicting emotion, a queasy stew of fury and gratitude. I can't tell if her suggestion is a dire insult or a lifeline. Why don't you have any friends, says Liev. I've got friends. What's wrong with you? He continues. I turn to face my stepfather. Everything's wrong with me. I say, half sarcastic, half sincere. He gazes at me, baffled, then swats the air between us. Ah, he says, directing an I give up shrug at mum. Maybe you should try it, she says, looking up at me, her face frozen into a ludicrously false attempt to that encouragement and optimism. Maybe you should try it. Maybe you're the crazy one. I bark back, my voice springing up into a, up to a little boy's squeak, then back down again. 
Liev stands, his chair legs screeching against the floor tiles. Don't you dare speak to your mother like that. Mum gets up too, and Edge is between us. It's okay, she says. He's just upset. I stare at Liev, blinking, but not looking away or stepping back. He's still much taller than me, but not by much. He's still taller than me, but not by much, and not for much longer. Why did you bring us here? I say. Because where we belong, says Liev. Right here. Says who? God? I won't have you talking like that in my house. Like these things are some kind of joke. I tilt my head back and roll my eyes, trying to look bored rather than afraid. I turn and walk to my bedroom, ignoring the sound of Liev yelling at me to come back. to learn some respect, to grow up. A while later, Mum knocks, opens my bedroom door a crack, pushes through a bowl of strawberries and closes it again. A peace offering. I know how my mother works. Today it was a suggestion. Next week it will be a demand. In time she'll force me. Unless I can find a way to appear normal and happy, they will, appear, they will send me to a shrink. I have no idea what those people do but I can guess. If they are experts in anything, it's wheedling out information people don't want to give. It will be like an interrogation, and I don't know if I'm strong enough to hold my secret. Much later, after the house has gone silent, I slip out of bed and reach behind my wardrobe. The scarf feels smooth and slippery against my skin. Worn down to a smooth, perfect softness through the years of use, I bundle it up and sniff. It smells not of the girl, but of her house. It smells of the other side, of spicy food and alien soap and cigarettes and foreign sweat. I take it to bed with me, inhaling the scents of these unknowable people, with their strange homes and mysteriously constricted lives, as if studying these smells might unravel the mystery. All the time I've lived here, I've been told stories about the enemy and what they want, us to, want to do to us and how only our army can stop them. Everything about Amarias, about the way it's built, where it's, the way it's built, where it's built, the wall, the soldiers, the checkpoints, springs from this story. If you doubt this, your whole world dissolves. In Amarias, if you don't know who your enemy is, you don't know anything at all. I twist the scarf round my hand, watching my fingers redden, then, go, then slowly go purple. The skin under the nails fades to a ghostly white, and my pulse begins to tingle in my fingertips. That girl, this girl, who saved my life using this scarf, was she the enemy? Was she my enemy? I realise the twist on the scarf, I release the twist on the scarf, and feel the blood pressure in my hand equalise. My sausagey fingers quickly return to normal. I think of my father and how he wouldn't allow me to see him in uniform. I never understood why, and I'm, not sh and I'm still not sure, but this memory seems like a droplet of sanity within a drenching storm of confusion. As I think of him, heading off for his military service in his t-shirt and shorts, with his huge green army bag slung across his shoulders, it strikes me for the first time a thought as crisp as the chime of a bell. That unless I do something myself to fight the shame and guilt that's haunting me, I might be crushed by it. Like the sensation of blood flowing back into my whitened fingers, I feel some strangled, starved essence of myself refill and revive as I realise what I have to do. My bag is packed and ready. One. Two bags of rice. Two bags of pasta. One bag each of lentils, chickpeas, walnuts, hazelnuts and pine nuts. A packet of ginger biscuits. Two bars of chocolate. Three tins of soup. Two each of chopped tomatoes, tuna and sardines. A jar of honey. One bag of flour. One of sugar. Most of it I have taken gradually, over a fortnight or so, from mum's larder picking out spares and doubles that were hidden underneath things. 
never taking more than a couple of items at any given time. The rice, pasta, flour and sugar I have bought partly with my savings, partly with a banknote I found inside Mum's purse. I picked them up on the way home from school and during homework time transferred them from my school bag to a hiding place. Underneath the winter clothes in the bottom drawer, underneath, in a hiding place, underneath the winter clothes in the bottom drawer of my wardrobe. This amount of food is as much as I can hide, and probably as much as I can carry. Two, change of clothes. Bought from a charity shop during a visit to see my aunt in the city. Now I've seen what people wear on the other side, it wasn't hard to find something that will allow me to blend in. It's not radically different, just old jeans, scruffy shoes and a baggy t-shirt. But the clothes I already own all look too pristine and somehow stamped from where, with where I'm from. A baseball cap is the key element. I noticed a couple of people wearing them, so I think a big one pulled down low will conceal my face without making it look like I'm trying to hide. 3. Torch The size of a marker pen doctored with a few stripes of packing tape around the middle, like a belt with a dangling end. The idea is that I'll be able to pull the loose flap of packing tape, put the loose flap of packing tape in my mouth and cast some light ahead of me, but still have both hands free for crawling. Map four map. It's easy enough to find one in the one on the web and print it out. Not so easy to locate my start or end point. After studying it night after night, rehearsing in my mind the route the girl took to walk me back to the tunnel, I draw on, in pencil, an educated guess as to where I might, I think I might emerge. Where I expect to find the Flying Cake Bakery, my path along the main shopping street, and the three turns that should take me to the girl's home. The map is only a safety net. I've committed as much of it, of it as I can to memory and plan not to look at it anywhere in the open. I can't risk be being seen reading a map. The last thing I do before putting it in the bag is to rub out my route. Five, the scarf. Six, the flip-flops. Seven, four plastic bags. Plain, with no writing or logos. Eight, football kit. To be placed over the top of the numbers one to seven, in case mum glances in the bag before I can get out of the house. I don't feel any fear until the moment I find myself standing on top of the dumpster, about to climb into the building site. The fringe of splinters sticking up from the top of the hoarding is the first thing to remind me that this isn't just an adventure, a lark. The feel of that jagged wood sticking into my flesh comes sharply back to me, sparking off a chain of half-forgotten memories. The sour, eggy smell, the envel enveloping darkness, the clammy soil against my palms, my breathless gasps echoing ahead of me like water slithering down a plug hole. I thought I'd remembered my fear, but it's clear that the truth about going under the wall has slid away. The memories I've been carrying around, like, around are like an outline, a dot to dot of the real thing. And only now, near the entrance to the actual tunnel, about to go through, do I feel the image filling itself up, filling itself in. Up close, the sheen of, of excitement evaporates, giving way to a sickening sensation in my throat and belly. This was fear. Dark, fierce and chilling. I knew my resolve was bound to falter at some point, and I prepared myself for this moment, with a short loop of invented footage, staged like an interview, my father looking, at, looking at me, out at me, telling me to be brave and carry on, telling me I'm doing the right thing, reminding me how much I owe the girl, and what it would mean to ignore this debt. I stand there on the dumpster with my eyes closed, and watch it once, twice, three times. When my eyelids pop open, I'm ready to carry on. Seeing how high it is from the dumpster to the top, I realise I can't get over the fence carrying the bag on my back. With the added weight, I won't be strong enough to pull myself up just using my fingertips. I lower the bag off my shoulders and swing it like a pendulum back and forth until each swing is up to shoulder height. Then, with all my might, I toss upwards, 
It hits the top, teeters, then clatters down noisily on the other side. I didn't design the package for such a long fall, and it seems unlikely that it would have landed undamaged. I should have chosen better. A jar of honey was a bad idea. I hoist myself up on the, onto the fence, and without pausing to look at the demolished house, climb down to examine my bag. I yank the zip open, pull out the decoy football kit and chuck it aside. As I feared, the honey jar has smashed. The only other breakage I can spot is the bag of sugar, which has split. There's no time to worry now, now to worry about the honey or to clear up the mess. I quickly strip, toss my clothes on the ground and put on the outfit I bought at the charity shop. A sticky streak is smeared across one thigh, but I look okay. I look ready for the other side. I lift the bag onto my shoulders and hurry towards the tunnel, grabbing a quick glance at the demolished house. It's still there, just how I remembered. I knew it would be, but I have to check. Even when something's real and right in front of you, it can still be hard to believe. The hatch is squarely in place over the hole. Was that how I left it? Did I move it back into position after I climbed out? I can't remember. Footsteps crisscross the area. People have come, come and gone. But when? I have no idea. I shunt the metal aside with two hands and lie on my belly, staring down into the darkness. There's nothing to see and nothing to hear. If anyone is down there, they are still and silent. My nostrils take in a dank, sour waft. I haul the bag towards me, lower it as far as I can into the column of black air and let it drop. I can hear the glass of the honey, sh honey jar shattering further. The sound of it reminds me of the torch which I have stupidly left in the bag. I hurry, not by knot, down the rope to the bottom of the hole and scramble through the bag in search of the torch. If it is broken, the whole thing's off. I can't go through the tunnel again in the dark, not for anything or any one. As soon as my fingers find the rigid metal in its packing tape, wrapper, I grip and twist. A beam of light springs into my face, dazzling me, and for a minute, an instant I am disappointed. My last chance to back out has gone. Moving as far as I can, I take up the position I practised in my bedroom, on all fours, with the bag hanging down under my stomach, the straps across the backs of my shoulders. This way it won't snag on the roof of the tunnel as I crawl. I put the torch in my mouth, gripped by its homemade handle, and look at the, ha the narrow void ahead of me. Tinkles of dust swirl in the feeble beam of yellow light. The tape in my mouth is bitter, rough against the tip of my tongue. It occurs to me that if I hadn't found this tunnel, I'd never be under the ground like this, surrounded by soil, until I, until I die. Died. This is where you go when your life is over. This is where they put my father. A memory spirals, spirals into my mind of his funeral, of picking up the spade from a con conical pile of soil, tossing in my three spadefuls, the thunk, 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 as the sods of earth landed on the coffin, each one a little less woody than the last, planting the spade back in the soil for the next person, only my mother ahead of me, a long queue of mourners behind. To one side, a row of soldiers in full uniform, heads bowed, armed. It strikes me that it's cold down here, pleasantly so at first, a relief from the sun. But if I stop moving or get stuck, this temperature won't seem so kind. I don't know if I'm more afraid of the tunnel or of the place on the other side. But as I begin to crawl, I sense a new kind of fear settle into me. Fear like a bite of lemon, sour but also sweet, repellent but delicious. I feel this fear embrace me. Focus me. Calm me. It tells me not to worry or speculate or count or guess at my progress. I just crawl. Without a thought in my head other than the act of crawling. I have a torch. If anything creeps towards me, this time I'll see it. I still hear occasional chirrups and squeaks, the odd fluttering of tiny feet, but nothing comes into view. The idea of the wall 
Somewhere above makes me tingle with excitement. All that concrete is right on top of me, as solid and impenetrable as ever. Yet I'm almost magically passing through to the other side with nothing to stop me. As I shunt myself forwards, the tins of food sway and clanking under my belly. I notice a new thing about the tunnel. The smell isn't constant. For one puzzling instant, I get a waft of coffee, then later cinnamon. A splintery scape against, scrape against my shoulder gives me an explanation. The ceiling props are made from packing crates, planks of wood buried deep underground, still clinging to a trace memory of their previous life. Sooner than seems possible, I feel as if I'm barely halfway through. I see the knotted rope looming into the pool of light ahead of me. I accelerate and reach out, needing to confirm with my hands in this strange, untrusty look, worth, untrustworthy light that the rope is really, really the rope. I slip the bag from my shoulder, shoulders and unzip it. The honey jar is shattered into several pieces, the lid still neatly screwed into a jagged ring of glass. Sticky golden goo has filled one corner of the bag and smeared itself over several of the tins and both bags of pasta. Roughly half the sugar has leaked away through the split, but the rest is salvageable. I take out my four plastic bags and pack the food into them, smearing off the worst of the honey with my hands. I put the flip-flops into the least sticky bag and using my cleanest fingertips, wrap the girl's scarf around my neck. Using a wooden ceiling prop, I try to scrape my hands clean, making a row of honey stalactites. Then I reach for the rope. I climb as quickly as I can, leaving everything at the bottom, and push the trap door aside. I've decided that if anyone is in sight, I'll close the lid, sit tight for a while, then try again. I'll give it three tries, maybe half an hour or so, then I'll give up. This is the plan. These are the limits of courage I've set myself. If I do turn back, I can just lift the food out of the tunnel and leave it there. Someone will find it. Someone will eat it. But now, thinking of the boys who tried to attack me, who might be up there looking out for me again, I remember that the tunnel seemed in some way to be theirs. If I leave any food in or near the tunnel, these are the people who will get it. Maybe even the boy who spat on me, the boy who looked like he was ready to kill me. Did I really want to leave a present for him? Perhaps he'd see the text on the labels and know where it was from and wonder if someone from the other side had come, come to help. Perhaps, no. I couldn't imagine my way into their heads. I will never know what those boys think, beyond that they despise me, and would be happy to watch me die. They know who their enemy is, me, and everyone like me. Under the bins, I can see the distant feet walking along the high street, but the alley is empty. I drop down and hoist up the four bags, one at a time. Before my last climb, I switch off the torch and stash it, all, stash it at the honey-free end of the bag. Crouching at the tunnel entrance, I push the hatch back into place. Before standing upright, I look in each direction once more, towards the street, towards the chain-link fence, up at the apartment windows above me, along the spray-painted edifice of the wall. Then I loop my sticky hands into the plastic bags and set off. With the cap pulled low and my chin angled downwards, my face is obscured from the view of anyone taller than me. I choose my pace carefully, fast enough to make quick progress, slow enough to appear unhurried. I look around casually and infrequently, as if I'm familiar with my surroundings and know, it, and know where I'm going. At the alley exit, alley exit, I glance up at the Flying Cake Bakery. <clears throat> this is my lighthouse, the only landmark I know, the beacon I'll be relying on to get me home. The same old man, sitting on the same plastic stool, is positioned in his doorway, still fiddling with the same cigarette lighter. He catches my eye for a moment, but doesn't seem surprised or interested. I turn right and walk. Struggling under the weight of my bags, the plastic handles cut into my fingers, but with the load distributed evenly on both sides, there's no relief to be great gained by swapping hands. 
The muscles across the top of my shoulders feel like taut cables pulled almost to snapping point. I decide to allow myself a quick pause every couple of minutes and to use these rests as the moments moment to look up and gauge my position. While on the move, I just force myself onwards with my head down. First rest. Still on the main street. On my left, a man with no front teeth standing behind a cart, arrayed with soaps, wallets, toothpaste, batteries, and a heap of cellophane-wrapped remote controls. Distorted music blares from tinny speakers behind his head. A high, mournful, slippery voice. I vaguely remember the look of the stall. Still on course. Second rest, same street, in a gap between a woman selling small gnarled aubergines from a wooden box and a shop festooned with brightly coloured ankle length coats. I avoid looking at the aubergine woman, sensing that I'm being watched. Up ahead is the first turn off to the right. This is the one marked on the map, but it feels too close to the tunnel and doesn't look right. I decide to keep going. Third rest, the next junction. There's a food shop on the corner selling cheese, milk and yoghurt from a glass-fronted fridge out at the street. I think I remember this, turning here with the girl. A man hovering in the doorway wearing tight pale jeans says something in my direction and takes a few steps towards me. So without looking up, I gather in my bags and hurry down the side street. Fourth rest. Dusty crossroads in the residential quarter. This is different from my pencilled route. Which involved a quick left right which involved a quick left right at a T junction, then a fork. Two men shoved past carrying a long bundle of copper pipes. They almost knocked me over, but I duck out of the way just in time. My cap falls off, but I get it back on fast. Bad idea to stop here. I take the turn the left turn. Fifth ref, fifth rest. My mental map has dissolved now, bearing no relation to the place around me. Is this the second of the two quick turns? I allow myself only enough time to get some sensation back in my fingers, then take a right, then take a right, plunging blindly on. Sixth rest. My shoulder muscles are trembling, my fingers stinging. This feels like the correct distance, but nothing looks right. I'm searching for a green front door with a square iron knocker. I remember it clearly. Or well, there's the black motorbike I hid behind, which should be parked in front of the house. Now I strayed from my route, as I'm as now I strayed from my route. I'm as good as lost, except for a mental thread I'm clinging to onto, the route back to the main road, and towards the bakery. I decide to keep going until I feel this thread weakening. The second I think I might be losing track of the way home, I'll just dump the bags and turn back. Seventh rest. Close to giving up, I know this street is wrong. In front of me is a yellow painted building set back from the street, which I'm sure I've never seen before. No one seems to be around, so I give myself a longer rest, then turn round. I hang on to the bags, but head back to the main street. Eighth rest. A green door, but no square knocker, no shutters on the window. I remember shutters above me when I looked up at the girl from my hiding place. Looking around, I see a whole street of green doors. This feels right. I pick up the bags and carry on. Ninth rest. An iron knocker, but not square, round. Shutters, but no motorbike. Could I have misremembered the knocker? I step towards the, the window and look at the ground, which is scattered with square indentations. The bike stand. I remember inches from my nose as I hid, the motorbike was supported by a metal stand. Stepping closer, I see a few small black circles just visible on the grey ground. Oil stains. I look again at the door, three steps up from the street. Yes, that's the door. With the bags at my feet, I look at the house. This is it. My scheme has worked. But as I stand there with my heart pounding, I realise I now have no idea what to do. My plan ends here, as if I were making an ordinary delivery to an ordinary family. But staring up at this doorway, I'm struck by the risks involved in knocking. Quite aside from the possibility this might be the wrong house, 
it's clear that someone other than the girl is likely to answer the door. What then? How will I explain myself? And if the girl isn't at home, what reception will I get? What would they do to me, a boy from the other side with the missing scarf and flip-flops, a few bags of food and no language to explain anything? I'd be at their mercy. The girl helped me, but the rest of her family might hate, on, hate me on sight, like the spitting boy and his friends. Every muscle and tendon in my body seems to slacken as I feel all confidence drained from me. My plan suddenly looks stupid, foolhardy, lethal. But I've come this far. I can't just drop everything and run for it. Not now. The urge to flee, to get myself back to the tunnel and home, tugs me away from the green door, hauling me backwards. But if I don't want my efforts to be wasted, I know I have to be at least I have to at least pro approach and leave the bags on the girl's doorstep. They might be stolen, they might not. But either way, if I do this, I'll know I tried my best. I inch towards the threshold and put the bags down as quietly as I can. Knock and run? No, no running. I mustn't do anything that could attract attention. The scarf, I decide, can go through the letterbox. Then I'll be able to return home confident that I'm no longer a thief. So a message the girl will understand. If she gets that, She'll know who delivered the food. I don't want praise or thanks, but I want her to know. The letterbox is small, with stiff springs, but the scarf fits through, if I stretch it out, and feed it in little by little. I do this as fast as I can, working the cotton in lumps from my, from my thumbs to my fingers, and poking at the narrow slot. I've almost finished when the door springs open, giving way in front of me, toppling me forwards. I straighten up as fast as I can and find myself looking into the angry bearded face of a man who looks a little older than Liev. This has to be the girl's father, the owner of the scarf, which is now hanging from the letterbox. He says something to me, a string of harsh, guttural words I can't understand, and I realise that given the choice between attempting to explain myself and running away, there's no contest. I promised myself I wouldn't run on this side of the wall. But this man, the look on his face, changes everything. It's time to run. I turn on my heel and bend my knees, poised to jump down the street. My toe is pressed against the lip of the top of the top step to launch me off. But before I'm airborne, something bites down hard on my, on my forearm. It feels like a machine, like an iron clamp fixing me in place. But it's the man's hand. Darts of pain shoot up my arm. I try to break free. I wriggle and twist and pull, but it's pointless. His fingers are as strong as handcuffs. Before I can speak, the man yanks me inside and slams the door. <laughs>